Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome back to the Pet Peeves Podcast. This is episode number 42. I have a very special guest. I always say they're special because, of course, all my guests are special. Welcome to the show, Jay Light. How's it going, Jay? Hey, I'm good, Albert. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, no problem, man. I saw that you uh, are, are, have your special out. I wanted to help you with that, some promo for that. And then you told me that you have two cats, which I think is awesome because I did not know that about you. I did not know you were a yeah. cat guy. I uh, I am a cat guy. I'm a cat dad. Yeah, I've got a four-year-old. Well, the four-year-old is my... Uh, so I moved in with my girlfriend last year, and the four-year-old belonged to her. So now I have adopted him. He is my cat stepson. <laughs> and then uh, we just adopted a new kitten about a month ago. Month and change. Right around 4th of July weekend. Wow, okay. So she's real young. She's like 14 weeks old. Super feisty. Uh, we thought she was a dude when we got her. <laughs> the rescuer and the first vet that she took him to, they were both were like, oh, yeah, he's totally a dude. And so we were like, okay, cool. We're going to, we, we gave him a, a boy's name. We named him Linus. Oh, they were and wrong. Then, I know. But then we found, we took her to the vet. To, to a real doctor. Right. Well, <laughs> we went to, we went to the one in our neighborhood. And it turns out vets in West Hollywood uh, are maybe a little bit more eagle eyed than vets in Reseda. Maybe. So. Well, you'd be surprised uh, how often that mistake happens where people have to rename their cat after the first six months. Because it is kind of hard to tell the boys from the girls when they're young, but it's not that hard. It should be pretty fucking doable. We named her Linus, and we ultimately decided to keep the name because we're like, Linus, Lioness, still works. She still still feels like a Linus. You know, we're breaking gender stereotypes. (laughs) Yeah, you guys killed it. Actually, when it comes to the name game, you guys are pretty gender fluid there. We're doing what we can, trying to further cat equality. Hey, man, somebody's got to be doing it. Somebody's got to be on the front line or the fur lines. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And when I'm you a- say, go ahead, what were you going to say? I was just going to say I'm a friend to, to all cats, you know, gender fluid, non-binary, male, female. We're allies. The whole shebang. We're allies in the alleys. Feline allies. Feline allies in the alleys. For all the alley cats. Exactly. See, man, we're doing great work here. Here we are. People just think we're comedians. No, we're humanitarians. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess for cats, catitarians. Catitarians, veterinarians. Oh, I'm not a vet. You you got more of that well, than I, I do. It. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, I, I think it's uh, always tough to introduce a young cat to an older cat. So you guys took a, a, a risk there. But how? where did you get the kitten from? Was it like a, a pet store scenario? Or did you like find it outside? No, uh, I have a friend who I am on an improv team with at the Pack Theater. She runs an independent kitten rescue. So she got him uh, from a litter in a truck in Northridge. Uh, it was just a feral or feral mom and uh, gave birth to a, a litter of kittens. She took him in, got him, you know, tested for worms and all that stuff. I had told her that I was in the market for a kitten. I figured she would probably have some. So we got her from... Uh, from from there, Tiny Tiger Rescue Los Angeles. That's awesome. I didn't never heard of that one. Tiger Tiny Tiger Rescue. Yep, it's a, that's awesome. Yeah, it's an no, independent recently, operation. Two gals. It's fun. Uh, they they do good work. Yeah, well, we'll plug them in the description. And if you wanna, uh, you know, send me their info, I'll definitely put it in the description. I'm trying my best to be more active in the animal world here. Now that I'm back in LA and I have like a a steady job so now i can actually like volunteer some of my time and obviously i'm not doing so much stand-up these days Mm -hmm. so i've been looking for all kind of rescues and shelters and fostering places that i can help out i can't really foster or shelter here we already have two pets and they want 800 hundred dollar deposits per pet where i live so we already have 1600 hundred dollars invested in pet deposits here and i'm not about to try to do that again but I do want to like work for an organization. So if there's anybody out there who needs an RVT, a registered veterinary technician, I'm more than willing to help you guys with your with your situations. And uh, Jay, thank you for adopting a kitten. It's going to end up in a shelter. Otherwise, have you been to any uh, shelters and seen the cat situations? No, I've heard bad things. Dude, it's, I... it's worse than bad. Bad is not the word to describe it. It's just sad is better. Well, I'm glad that I could uh, adopt and not shop. Absolutely, man. You did the right thing. And that's something that we talk about on the podcast a lot. You guys should be rescuing pets instead of buying from the pet stores. But who am I to say, man? Actually, pet stores, you know, those pets, if they don't get adopted, they end up living in a cage, too. So it's like, 
just sad all around animals mm-hmm. living in cages but so far so good with the introduction of the young cat to the old cat or older yeah, so far so far so good a couple of behavioral issues she likes to attack his tail and butt like their cat toys ah it's normal Right, we had we we took her to the vet last weekend to get her uh, her vaccinations for FLV and uh, FIV, mm-hmm. and we asked the vet. We were like, we because we Googled, you know, yeah, I mean, we're, just like with human illnesses, you Google anything that happens to you, and then Google immediately pops up with like pet WebMD, exactly with some weird shit, and it was everything Dr. we Google. found was like exact everything we found was like, oh, this is sexual behavior. This is sexual violence that your cat is inflicting on the other cat. And we were like, oh, this is, uh-oh. And we talked to the vet and we were like, so what's the deal? And the vet was like, nah, this is this is fine. She probably just has bad social skills. You'll just have to do a little bit more like behavioral work. Training. Like spritz yeah. her with a water bottle. Mm-hmm. End the play session because he's him hissing at her and swatting at her is clearly not doing the trick. She's a little, right. uh, a little slow on the uptake socially. Yeah, that's the hard part about adopting from, uh, you know, a litter that was found outside or whatever, like, a, you know, if you said feral cats, like you said, those feral cats, their personalities don't really start coming out until they're a little bit older. But it's just really, really hard to predict how they're going to turn out, especially cats. If they come from crazy parents, like if their parents are aggressive, they're very likely to be aggressive. If their parents are calm and docile, then they're extremely likely to be calm and docile. So if you just don't know who the cat's parents are. It's it's a gamble, but if you get them at a young age and you socialize them, and like they said, you teach them right from wrong without you know using physical violence on your poor pet, right? You, you can get them to figure it out. But you know, some cats are are like I'm telling you, and I and I know that you already got the the kitten, so we'll see what happens. But it's really difficult to introduce young cats to adult cats. It's like it's hard. It's like fifty fifty. Sometimes it goes good, sometimes it doesn't. And the real problem is with the adult cat, your older four year old. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a also a, it's a boy you said right yeah he's a boy he's he's pretty i mean that's the the thing that we were worried about and you know my girlfriend is much more experienced with introducing cats to each other and socializing new cats mm. than i do i grew up mostly owning dogs and then i we had like one cat around the house every now and every now and again sure um but she's grown up with cats her whole life so i just deferred to her on everything and you know, I know cats for the the social aspect. Smell is a big thing, mm-hmm. and so we did our, our due diligence to make sure they were separate for a little while and just get acclimated to each other's smells. And so the nice thing is, he's not like hissing at her smell. He's he's just not liking her behavior, and he'll and he's figured out. Annoying. Yeah, he's figured out how to be like passive aggressive about it. But we did get worried at one point. It was like a week. After she'd been here, or maybe two weeks. It was like, yeah, it was like two weeks after she'd been here. Because after a week, they seemed okay. We started to let them hang out with each other a yeah. little bit. And then about two weeks in, she uh, she was getting over having some diarrhea. And she tr- tracked poop on her paw out of the litter box and accidentally tracked it on the ground outside the litter box. Yeah. And he came in. We had her litter box set up in our bedroom. He came in. He freaked out. <laughs> and started hissing and then he got into her litter box and peed for like a solid minute just <laughs> opened the floodgates it was like uh, the kitten dam broke and it was just the standing pee in the litter box and he you know marked his territory showed his yeah. boss and she was just super freaked out she was like i don't know what just happened we were like all right he Ed, edgar's throwing his weight around he knows what he has to do yeah, unfortunately, you got to kind of let them figure it out. I think, uh, and whatever advice you're getting from your vet, take take the doctor's advice over mine. But I, in my opinion, <laughs> it's nice to have uh, an extra litter box when you bring another cat around. Like, if you're bringing another cat, bring one litter box for the cat and another litter box for your cat in case, for whatever reason, it doesn't want to use the litter box where it used to. Because, you know, when cats get freaked out, when cats get traumatized for whatever reason or a big abrupt change in their life the first thing that happens is they they want to start going to the bathroom outside of the litter box that's one of the first things they want to start marking their territory under the furniture or just places that they normally wouldn't so you have to give them another place to go to the bathroom just to decrease the likelihood that they do that because that's the number one reason why people get rid of their pets their cats for going outside the litter box and for ripping up their furniture oh really yeah especially the litter box thing i think is harder harder to fix than the the furniture thing the furniture thing just get more scratch posts and honestly you got to be there to stop your cat from clawing up the furniture like you said with the squirt them with the water bottle 
that works, but you got to be there. If you're not there and your cats are ripping up your furniture and your your curtains and stuff, there's nothing you can do about it. But right. as far as litter boxes, if you get another litter box, it, it does highly decrease the likelihood they're going to start using the bathroom outside of it. And that's just a problem that's really hard to fix once they start. Once a cat starts going outside of the litter box, it's damn near impossible to get them to stop doing it. They'll just keep doing it in the same spot, no matter how many times you clean that spot. So hopefully you're not having any issues like that. No, we've had two litter boxes the whole time we've had them. And we actually even upgraded one of our litter boxes. We had one when we had just him that was like a top loader litter box. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's something that helps cats feel more protected or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I guess. I have one too. I have a covered one and then I open yeah. one. I have two. But we have a covered one now that's supposed to be a multi-cat litter box. And uh, we brought that one in like a week or two ago. So, But we still have two litter boxes and they, they haven't had any issues with like using the bathroom outside of their litter box. That's awesome. You should definitely have three though. You should have one more than cats you have. That's the golden rule. One more we, litter box than cat you have. So if you have, have two cats, you should have three <laughs> litter boxes. I have heard that. Maybe... Uh... When we got to figure out a place for another litter box, but we seem to be doing all right so far. Yeah, I mean, if you're not having a problem, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's what my mom always said. But in case mm -hmm. it ever does become an issue, that's something to look into. If just, just for future reference. Good to, like, good to it, keep in mind. Yeah, especially like I have a one bedroom apartment here with my wife, right? So there's not even like a bunch of places you could put a litter box where one of them is not going to be like an eyesore. So I get that it's not always functional to do that. But just in the situation where you're like introducing cats to each other if you're having litter box issues out there if anybody listening is having the cat go outside the litter box problem try getting another litter box and try moving the litter boxes around because you know like once you introduce a new cat to an environment the old cat st stays away from the new cat and maybe mm -hmm. the new cat's hanging out where the litter box is do you know what i mean yeah that's been the litter box. We've figured out good places to keep them now, especially since we're not having her just be in the bedroom all the time because that was kind of her. We're, you know, we're in a one bedroom too. Mm -hmm. And the bedroom was basically her room whenever we first brought her in. And so now we've allowed them to sort of co mingle and coexist. So we've had to move her stuff out of the bedroom so that way it's not just her domain and, yeah. and he feels like he can still come back in and hang out. But we're still figuring out like the best places to put like her food, uh, some of her 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 bed. They've got a few things that they share as far as toys. Like they have a cat tree that they share, but sure. there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of food jockeying for position that goes on still. But I'm sure that that's pretty normal. Yeah, just got to keep an eye. I mean, are you guys there a lot? I imagine quarantine, COVID, everybody's pretty much home. So yeah, at least you could be there to regulate their behavior. Yeah, there's pretty much. No time when night when when both of us are gone from the apartment. It's always either one of us or both of us here. Yeah, and then with a, a one bedroom, it's pretty easy to keep your eye on them. Like the same thing with my pets. Like if my my cat and my dog food, we have to separate because the dog will eat the cat food and the cat will eat the dog food, so we have to separate it. But if the cat tries to go near the dog bowl, the dog will growl at her and snarl at her, and may maybe one day she will attack her. I don't know. So I try to keep them apart, but it is hard. It's hard to separate. Your pets from eating, it's hard to separate cats from eating anything because, you know, I can't put the dog bowl on the counter. The cat will just jump up there and eat it. So I have to, like, hide the dog food. So we try to just portion feed and just give the dog, like, exactly how much they'll eat in that meal. Give the cat exactly how much they'll eat in that meal. And if they don't, take it away. Yeah, th that's pretty much what we started doing with uh, with our cat. Edgar, he as uh he picked it pretty quick on, like, oh, if if I'm getting food right now, I have to eat all of it or else... It will go away. Yes, yes. That's what you want to teach them, that they have to eat now or it's going to go away. And then they do. They do. They learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially you got to be careful with cats because they get fat, they get diabetic, and they get kidney problems and heart failure and all these problems because they're overweight. And the main thing is, is uh, people overfeed them because the cats beg. The cats beg and beg and beg and beg. So if you already teach your cat to eat portion feeding meals, then they beg less. They, yeah. We didn't even realize that until we she we ca we brought her into the picture and she's you know she's a kitten she's so small she just like gained she's three and a half pounds now yeah. and he we we didn't realize you know we he's a he's a pretty big boy he's like large and long but he also started to develop the little like the belly 
fat, you know, mm-hmm. like yeah, the, yeah. the foop, the cat fupa. Yeah, the fat pads. Yeah, so mm-hmm. we uh, we were like, oh, we got to figure out how to regulate this. And it turns out we just had dry food out for them all the time, and that's uh, it's not great if you want to try and regulate your cat's weight. Yeah, it's not. I mean, you if you're just leaving it out all the time, no, they're mm-hmm. just gonna graze and eat. Yeah, so eat we, and sleep. Eat and sleep. So now we have uh, taken away the dry food, except for very special occasions, and we're pretty much just sticking to a wet diet for him. And he's uh, he's adapted. He's adapted. That's all it is. Adapt and overcome. Mm-hmm. I mean, my cat started getting fat, too, and we were overfeeding her because she's she was a baby. You know, when they're kittens, you can feed them a lot, and they're not going to get gain weight, especially if they're on kitten food and they're kittens and blah, blah, blah. But then my cat did start getting fat, and the fat pads were, like, really noticeable, and she was only a year old, so we had to cut back. And she's crazy. She'll eat, like, she'll... Have you ever seen the, the YouTube videos or the TikTok videos where the cats, like, open their mouth all wide like a snake and then mow down giant mouthfuls of food and just swallow without chewing have you seen these videos no i haven't yeah it's very freaky it's like an alien eating and that's kind of <laughs> that's what my cat does she just sticks her face in the bowl opens up her mouth and closes it and swallows like hungry hungry hippos like she doesn't chew and she doesn't regulate and then she'll like walk away and throw it all up she's just Oof. a psycho so we had to like start feeding her tiny amounts, like just the amount that'll fill up her little stomach. You know what I mean? Her stomach right. can't be bigger than like, you know, an empty balloon. And and it doesn't take much to fill that up. So we just, I, I you know, read up on it. What do we do with these kind of situations? They sell those bowls that have prongs. So dogs will have to eat slower and cats will have to eat slower. Oh, I've never even heard of that. Yeah. So it's a problem with not just cats, but dogs, a lot of dogs do it too. Like, especially the bigger dogs that just like don't chew. You know, they'll swallow their food all fast, and then it'll make them throw up. So you do the prongs, and it helps. And for our cat, we just feed her a tiny little... She's a tiny cat. She's fucking maybe six, seven pounds. So she's not like your cat. What'd you say? She's like three pounds? Yeah, the kitten's about three and a half pounds now, and then our uh, four-year-old's like 13 pounds. Holy shit. He's big. He's a big That's boy. That's a big boy. That's awesome, though. That's awesome, man. I like big cats. I like. I'm a, I grew up a dog guy, but I always loved all animals. But I just, like, I have a really good cat right now, and that's just a special thing. When you have a good cat, a lot of cats suck. So if you have a good yeah. cat out there, give me a big Edgar's a great cat. Linus, horrible. But she's learning. <laughs> yeah, you'll And she gets away with it because she's cute. So we, uh, you know, we're figuring it out. We're and helping she's her. Young. We're, yeah. yeah. She's, she's still kitten. young. She's a kitten. You got to let her get through the kitten phase and just don't let her get away with bad behavior. Like, you're, like whoever gave you that advice stop the play when the other cat is hissing or stop the play when the kitten is being, you know, too rambunctious or too aggressive. That's all it is. You know, people have that, that instinct to want to play fight with their kitten and their puppy. And I get it. It's cute, but one day they're going to be bigger (laughs) and one Mm -hmm. day you're going to have people over and one day it's not going to be funny anymore. So, I mean, play fighting is all good if you're like a legit animal trainer and you know what you're doing, but if you're just going to like play fight with your dog and then go to work for eight hours, it's not really going to, help your pet right i think being home is a big part of it and you know this this is an interesting debate if we want to get to covid19 things uh people are saying that now that everybody is home with their pets that all the pets are going to have separation anxiety once covid is over and we all have to go back to our normal lives man i i mean i'll admit it's definitely factored into the decision for us to get another cat to because we're home all the time but also we were running into edgar feeling loneliness beforehand mm-hmm. like he's 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 got some problems he's a he takes a prozac every day for, oh, wow. for feline anxiety no shit so, he's on the prozy the kitty he's prosy. on the prozac he takes the kitty prozac every morning he uh and before we got linus before we brought her in the picture he was uh, he, he was meowing all the time and, and, and being very just like trying to get our attention, even if we are home, you know? Mm. So I don't is think he, that- Is he neutered? Yeah. Mm, okay, go ahead. I just don't think us being gone whenever we are able to like both be out of the house and go back to work is going to change his behavior, but he does seem much more calm and content having another cat around the house, even if she is a little bit of a-, a nightmare sometimes i bet man i'm telling you my dog and cat like we got a cat out of just because we wanted another pet and that's just the one that fell into our labs but we already had Mm -hmm. a dog i was sort of like your situation i moved in with my now wife then girlfriend and she already had a dog so i'm like dog stepdad and then we got a cat together not to be friends with the dog but also to be friends with the dog 
And then we just got really lucky that they got along. But in the beginning, the dog was really rough with her, like really like overly rough with her. And we always had to like, cause my dog is a little terrier dachshund mix and she just plays, oh, okay. she plays rough. She's got like this, you know, big dog mentality, even though she weighs 14 pounds. And she like, if you take her to the dog park, she's going to try to play fight with the biggest dog in the yard. Cause she's an idiot. So she was like <laughs> really mean with our kitten and like not where I thought she would hurt her on purpose, but maybe on accident. So we had to keep separating them, keep separating them. But we would always make them be together. Like we would make them interact, make them interact. And if it, the interaction got out of control, we would stop them. And we just repeated this process, repeated this process for so long. And now they'll, they'll fight, they'll play fight, but they're best friends. They'll sleep together. They, they play together. They lay together. And it's probably the best th decision that we could have made for my dog, just for the dog to have, somebody to play with because the dog's super high energy she's a terrier and we can't we can't keep up with that but the cat they run around they chase each other it's beautiful it's like what you would dream of for a dog and cat relationship and they're both girls and the dog's a little bit older the cat's younger like the dog's five cats one and uh you know if we can maintain this relationship with them that's great but we still debate about getting another cat we always debate about getting another cat because we give the dog a lot more attention. The dog comes with us when we go on trips. The dog comes with us when we go to the park. We take the dog on walks. And the cat's like stuck home alone. We went to Indiana for three days and we left the cat home alone and we took the dog with us. So we're like, you know, that kind of sucks for the cat. Right. Maybe we should get another cat for those times when we want to leave and not take the cat with us. Yeah, that's the thing we've thought about is like uh, if we wanted to go on a camping trip or a road trip or something – because that seems to be the safest way to travel right now if you wanted to get out. We, oh, yeah. we, we talked about like renting an RV and going somewhere, but she travels way better than he does. You know, the four-year-old Edgar is uh, a big, big Frady cat, as it turns out. And he does not like being outside at all. Uh, but she's totally cool with like getting in the carrier. She'll just walk right in. That's awesome. Anytime we have to get him in the carrier for anything, it's just a nightmare. So this poor I, guy. What, yeah. What's his background? Why does he have so much anxiety? Was he a rescue or has she had him his whole life or what? She's had him his whole life. Uh, he was a rescue, but he was, uh, but she's had him since he was a kitten. And he had uh, fleas a long time ago. So like he was adopted with his sister cat. Um, they both got fleas. And after the fleas, he still had what what the vets have assumed to be like a uh, like a psychosomatic itching he like started over yeah he started over grooming himself you know to the point where he was like licking his fur off and licking parts of his skin raw and bloody damn and so we uh we talked to the vet uh, you know a number of different vets the vet we have now for him got him on a combo of uh, the Prozac and then uh, a steroid so he takes the Prozac every day and then the steroid every other day. So it the the anxiety and the OCD is curbed and then also the the itchiness. Potential itchiness in case there is any residual itchiness is also curbed. Right. And now he's just uh just robust. I'm looking at him right now. He's just looking looking very He's a good he's a good looking boy. He's just chilling over there on my carpet. Yeah, you got to send me some pictures with you and the cat so I could use them for promo. That's the the one thing that I, that sucks that when I can't get together with you guys anymore. Like I used to have people come over and we'd record, but now doing it with Zoom, I can't take a picture with you. So you got to send me a picture with you and your cats. Oh, I got you, dude. And then I use those for promo, and people eat them up. People love that shit. There's a lot of cat dads out there. I'm one of them. You're one of them. Oh, I was talking to uh, Craig Conant. He's a cat dad. Oh, it's nice. Of, yeah, a lot of comics have cats these days. I think it's like, the it's finally been okayed for dudes to have cats. <laughs> yeah, there's such a stigma around cat dads for a long time. I'm not, mm. a, I'm not a fan of that stigma. No. Because cats are fucking chill. Yeah. Super cats chill. got this reputation as, a, as, like a, as like a shitty pet to have. I don't know why, but I love cats. Cats are great. Yeah, people want the dumb, blind allegiance and loyalty of a dog i'm like yeah that's cool i love my dog but my dog is definitely not as like cool of a pet as the cat the cat's like a silent hunter killer my dog's just like a goofy friend you know what mm -hmm. i mean it's it's different it's a totally different kind of relationship but <laughs> excuse me a relationship with a cat feels earned <laughs> a relationship with a dog it's just like all right yeah Cheap. that was bound to happen anyway <laughs> yeah for sure my dog is 
is easy. She she has no loyalty. Whoever has food, that's her best friend. Right. It's mm-hmm. like a, a wife versus a mistress. Oh yeah, for sure. You cannot trust the mistress. Exactly. But the cat but the wife, oh, wife's always there for you. Yep. Loyal. There. <laughs> The cat is kind of a dick. She only gives me attention when she wants something. If she wants food or she wants me to pet her, she wants me to let her outside like we have a little patio that she can go out on. Mm -hmm. And she tricks me. She makes me think that she likes me. And then she'll like show me what she really wants. And I'll be like, you bitch, you got me again. (laughs) But when she was a kitten, she did love me. When she was a kitten, she would be all upon me. But somewhere, somewhere in the year, she started gravitating towards my wife and away from me. And I don't know what it is. Like every time I'm home... Like, say me and my wife are in the same room, they're where we are. But if my wife and I are in different rooms, they're always where she is. And it's pretty sad. It hurts yeah. me. Yeah. My, uh, my girlfriend, you know, she, the, since the cat was hers before we lived together, he naturally sort of was sticking with her and, and does continue to mostly stick with her. But he's, uh, he's warmed up to me a lot. He, I used to have this big desk. And he would come and hang out on the desk all the time whenever I'd be working. And there would be some times when she'd be traveling and be gone for like a week or two. And me and him would just, you know, just be hanging out, bonding. I'd give him some treats. We'd play with his feather. It's all good times. And then she would come back and he would just be hanging out on my side of the bed. She'd just be lamenting. They're like, oh, come back, come back. Just Mm -hmm. be on my side of the bed. You're my kitten. But he's, no, no, he he turns. But he's- You uh, want him over. Yeah, I won him over. I figured out how to be a good uh, be a good cat dad. Yeah, the feather is where it's at, man. If you just play with them, maybe that's what I'm not doing enough. I'm not playing with my cat enough. I just like pet her. I don't I don't play with her like I used to. I guess you got to play, dude. We have a we have a laser pointer and a feather. Mm. The laser pointer, the Edgar used to play with it a little bit, and then he sort of figured out that it's you can't he can't win with the laser pointer the way he can with the feather. All right, but the kitten. Linus is fascinated with the laser pointer and she chases it around to the point where now we've used the laser pointer so much with her that Edgar has started to be interested in the laser pointer again. <laughs> and he's just sort of, he'll, he'll start running after it and galloping around like a, a, a lineman who catches a pass out of nowhere <laughs> and is running for a touchdown. And it's very, it's, it's, but it's great though. Like he's way more energetic now. That's the thing that I think is like, proof that he was a little bit lonely and lethargic before and having another cat around even if she is kind of a nightmare she keeps him on his toes and he's Mm -hmm. way more interested in playing in ways that he hadn't been before so it's nice to see that yeah that's important i really do think it does encourage them to play and be more active and at least just like get them off their butts bring another get another cat around and uh, they need that they need the exercise they need the stimulation and i think Mm -hmm. they they like being around their own species if i had to guess but the 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 laser thing, my cat loves the laser. It's awesome. She's like fixated though. Like we have to put it away because she'll start acting all OCD. She'll start like sc- scratching and meowing and like l- everything becomes the laser to her. She's like staring at all the lights, you know? Oh, so yeah. I, yeah, I feel kind of bad for her because I, I know eventually I'm going to put it away and she's still going to look for it for hours. But it's yeah. hilarious. When, it, when I take it out, she's, she loves it, man. She goes crazy. Just like that movie uh, Life of Pets 2. Have you seen this? No, I haven't. Oh, it's funny. If you like animated movies, if you like the first Life of Pets, this one is just for the cat laser scene. It's so funny. It's worth it. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, if you and your your girl like uh, anim- animal movies, it's funny. And I, I had low expectations. I'm not a fan of most of those animateds, but they did a good job with this one. Life of Pets. Secret Life of Pets 2. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, Secret Life of Pets. Yeah, that's the one, because I, I know I don't trust a lot of animated movies besides Pixar movies. The occasional other one will, will pop out, do well, like some DreamWorks movies I really, really dig. But I remember seeing that, because that's from the same people who did Minions and Despicable Me, I think. Yeah, and yeah, I was just yeah. not interested in seeing those. But maybe I'll check out the uh, cat laser pointer scene. Yeah, you know, my wife will tell me oh this is funny you should watch this oh you should this is funny you should watch that and like most of the time i'm like man probably not but the one time that she nailed it that was fucking funny the cat <laughs> laser scene like they just nailed it like i'd been around a lot of cats and they just nailed cat behavior like that's the one thing this movie did well they took all these animals and they they turned their behaviors into jokes just very well they did a great job and i'm sure other movies have done it too but secret life of pets and they nailed it and I'm not a Kevin Hart movie fan either, so they had to win me over on that one. It's a Kevin Hart Oh, movie. right, yeah, Kevin Hart's in that movie. 
Right. Who is he? The bunny? He's the rabbit. The very he's annoying. The rabbit, yeah. He's the reason why I didn't want to watch the movie. <laughs> okay. As soon as I saw his character being all Kevin Hardy, I'm like, no, I can't do it. Yeah, I uh, I feel you on that. Yeah, everybody loves Kevin Hart except for me. <laughs> so we got a uh, a couple of segments. Let's see what time is it. So let's let's try to do one of these segments before we take our quick break. Uh, okay. So I do questions from the internet, where I give people on Facebook an opportunity to ask pet questions. Most of the time, they're ridiculous questions like we got today, but it's still fun to fun to answer. So our first question comes from Victor Martinez. Do you know Victor Martinez? I do know Victor Martinez. Shout out Garage Mike. Shout out Garage Mike. Victor is one of my best friends. He's a Goon Squad member. He's I've we've roasted. Victor beat me in the roast battle. Uh, but I've been friends with him probably just as long as anybody in LA and definitely met him in the belly room. Show up, go up. Shout out to show up, go up days in the belly room. Shout out. So Victor runs the Garage Mike, one of the, the more popular open mics and shows here in LA. It's in a garage behind a Food for Less in Koreatown. And probably the scariest alley. Uh, but yeah, slang some jokes out there. Slang some jokes. Slang some crack. So Victor asks, what is, what's your stance on furries? You know what furries are? I do know what furries are. Yeah. I, uh, I went to high school with a kid who he be, later became a furry. And him <laughs> no coming sure. out as a furry on Facebook was... I felt like on one hand, I was like... This is anytime somebody is a furry, like just the concept of being a furry is funny to me. Yeah, <laughs> because like you're wearing a you're wearing a like a custom made mascot costume that probably has like a genital hole cut out for for whatever whatever you got down there, mm -hmm. and you're just wearing that around and hanging out and being an animal, and you've got that incorporated in your sex life. It's just a funny sex thing, but also like seeing that he was a furry, it just warmed my heart because I was like, oh, you finally you found you you finally found your thing. <laughs> you found your you thing. Be comfortable in <laughs> in yourself. And he's uh, the cherry soda fox. So. I think uh, I would never be interested in furry stuff. It's just I like I can't, I don't understand the appeal of it. But if you're a furry, shout out, good for you, congratulations. Yeah, I'm I'm I, I barely know what a furry is. Like I do. It's people who dress in these elaborate, like you said, mascot like costumes, and I'm pretty sure it's all sexual. But I yeah, I'm, I could be wrong. So I looked it up right because I wasn't sure. So it says. The furry fandom is a subculture interested in anthropomorphic animal characters with human personalities and characteristics. The term furry fandom is also used to refer to the community of people who gather on the internet and at furry conventions. It doesn't say anything about sex, but I'm pretty sure that that's a big part of it. Sex is a big part of it, for sure. Yeah, like you said, they all got dick holes, and they're like, I don't know. So I, I, I've never been to a furry convention, but one time I got invited to a furry party at a hotel. I got invited through somebody that in Long Beach, I think somebody that I was doing stand up with and they invited me to this party and I was like, all right, I'll check it out. I didn't have a costume. I was going to go wearing regular people's clothes uh -huh. and I knew that was going to be a problem. Like I was going to be the one person in there that didn't have a costume on. So I was just like this freak. Like I was going to be the weird one. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I had like reservations and I didn't really, and Long Beach can be sketchy and the person was like somebody I didn't know that well. And uh, I went and I pulled into the parking lot and I saw everybody going in. It was just a bunch of dudes. It was all dudes. And I was like, nope, fuck that. <laughs> and I just turned around and went home. And that was the closest I ever got to a furry party. Yeah, I know that there's a couple big furry conventions that happen across the U.S. I'm pretty sure that Dallas has one. I know that there's one uh, Midwest Fur Fest. I've seen the All Gas No Breaks video about Midwest Fur Fest. It's it's really great, super, super entertaining, super interesting. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things that, like, the subculture of it, there's so many weird internet subcultures that I will never understand, but I wish that I had the time to figure out more about them. But, you know, is what it is. Do what yeah, makes well, you, you got happy. Time. You're still young, right? I, I don't know how old you are. How old are I'm you? almost 30, dude. I don't have time oh. to be researching furries anymore. You're almost 30. I'm 36, and I just uh, looked up furries for uh, the first time. So there's still time, dude. I'm fucking uh, old. 
Well, who, so, who knows? We'll see. Maybe it's relative. Uh, maybe that's my. Maybe that'll be my thirties. Is diving deep into the furry culture. Yeah, you never know. When I went to that furry party, I was probably thirty-one when I considered going. I'm telling you, after I turned thirty is when I was like, ah, fuck it, I'll try anything. You know what I mean? Like, what do you got left? But you got to be single <laughs> to have that. Oh, mentality. see, yeah, no, I can't. I don't have right. that. I'd have to. I'd have to convince my girlfriend to go to the furry party. That's a with tough sell. Me. Tough sell. Well, maybe. Got, she, I mean, they she's sell a writer. There. So maybe we can, uh, maybe we we write a script together. You ever see Best in Show? Yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. John I Cleese. Think, no, um, uh, uh, Christopher oh, Guest. N- oh, okay, it's a different one. Yeah, it's yeah, about yeah. the dogs. Yeah, the dog. The show. dog show. Yeah, but that's the one. Uh, I feel like there's got to be a version of like Best in Show, but about furries. Like the oh, furry mockumentary's got to exist somewhere. So maybe I can convince her to go. We can go check out a furry convention and and write something about it. Dude, that's funny. I can already picture it. Best in show. Yeah, that's, I've seen that movie maybe once or twice. It's great. It's on yeah, Hulu it's now. Really I funny. watched it. We watched it again. It's one of my all-time favorite comedies. We watched it again a couple weeks ago. It's just so, so great, top to bottom. So funny. It's just got a killer cast, too. Yeah, killer cast. Almost everything's improvised. Top-notch performances. Really funny jokes. It's it's fantastic. What's this guy's name that actually, that recently passed? Uh, uh, Fred Willard. Fred Willard, yeah, and he's in it. Yeah, he was. He plays uh one of the commentators in it. He's great. Yeah, man, that's sad. Uh, I don't know how that came up, but that just made me sad. But best of show, any kind of dog movies. If you're out there in Hollywood and you got a dog idea, let me know. I would love to get on, jump on board with some dog dog shit. I have written some stuff for people who have like uh, a veterinarian in their script, and they went, "Oh, I want this to sound professional, and I help people with their scripts," but. That's about it. Other than that, I need I need Dog Hollywood to hit me up. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I've heard the the only dog story recently that I heard about in Hollywood was uh, a dog's purpose. You mm-hmm. remember that when that video oh, yeah. came out? Yeah, the saddest movie ever. Yeah. Well, but that's the the other thing too is they were like mistreating the dog on set. <laughs> like the dog. Yeah. There was that video that came out of like the dog. Yeah. The German trapped Shepherd in, like, like river drowning. Rapids. Yeah. yeah. Just like, come on, if you're going to make a movie about dogs, make sure the dogs feel like pampered and nice and don't mistreat your animals on set. Jesus. No, man, it was like capitalism at its worst. Like, we're making this movie about dogs, but fuck dogs. We want to make our money. And it's just like, if we can make this, this, it's unnecessarily sad, that movie. Like, if you want to go on an emotional roller coaster as an animal lover or a dog lover, go watch that movie. This is and why then, we only need animated dog movies. Exactly. This is why all dogs go to heaven is great because, like, you can feel the emotions associated with dogs, but you don't have to actually watch live dogs. Right. The suffering of a cartoon dog is enough for me. Like, I think all dogs go to heaven is the reason why I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was a kid. That was like, that's all I needed to see an animated dog suffering. And I was like, nope, I got to put a stop to it. Right. You can't, you can't do that. That's, uh, imagine if it was a real dog, right? Ugh. If you'd watched Old Yeller, what would you be now? You'd probably run in a whole rescue. <laughs> oh, yeah, if I would have seen Old Yeller first. But I saw Old Yeller when I was in middle school, and I was already, like, tainted. <laughs> <laughs> I was already, like, not a real... I was already too interested in girls than any other kind of life. Yeah. All right, so the other question, still from Victor, there's one more. He says, why do they call it doggy style instead of horse style? <sighs> I mean... <laughs> does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me. I think it's probably because... It's if we're go if it, it, it just it makes more sense. Like you can picture a dog having sex with another dog real easy. Like doggy style is the thing. Mm. I feel like people still don't know what it looks like in the general population when horses have sex. Agreed. I like, think that most people have not seen two horses have sex in real life. But right. I think anybody, even if you haven't seen, you can imagine what two dogs look like having sex. Right. You've seen a dog. If you exist in the world, you've pretty much seen a dog humping somebody's leg or a yeah, piece of furniture exactly, or a stuffed animal. Exactly. Even but, if it's not actually copulating, you've seen a right. dog try to fuck something. <laughs> yeah. If you've seen a horse have sex, you're either super rich or you've watched Mr. Hands when you were in middle school. And yeah. either of those things, not great. Yeah. Or you grew up breeding horses for some odd reason, which, like you said, either you're rich or somebody in, in your family is rich. Mm-hmm. How much horse experience do you have? I don't have a ton. I worked at a summer camp for a number of years that had a horseback uh, section. 
But I was always a waterfront guy. We had a horse, the, like there's sort of a, an, a, a, a very loose rivalry between the guys who ran the stables and the horseback ring and the uh, the guys who worked down at the docks and like <laughs> taught swimming and sailing and boating. Yeah. And uh, I was one of the, the like, I was like the head of swimming classes and I was with lifeguard and I would teach some uh, like canoeing and boating stuff. So I was down there. They called us, uh, they, they just got made fun of us for like getting tans and haircuts while they were doing real man's work, shoveling horse poop, <laughs> cleaning yeah. stables. Yeah. That's how the, the horse community looks at the rest of the world. Like we're some bitches. <laughs> but it's yeah, not, listen, not true man if you hang around with horses and people who are around horses they're always like tough you know they're just like tough they just yeah don't, you, they don't mind getting dirty they don't mind getting kicked they don't mind picking up shit and i'm not saying they're they're like ufc fighter tough but i'm you know the general population is afraid of shit yeah like, it's just the main thing that steers people away from like from working horse. with animals right especially because there's animals. a lot of shit there's tons of shit dude literally but horse dudes are tough. Like my dad was uh, was working at the camp too for a while while I was still there, and he was a horse guy. And so I remember hearing a story about him one day. They had uh, they were try they had this new colt that they were trying to break in, and it wasn't a horse; it was a donkey. It was like a it was a it was a, a baby donkey, and uh, it was very feisty. And it kicked my dad in the head, and my dad like fell off this bench that he was sitting on. And then he just got back up and he just started laughing because he was like, this yeah. is ridiculous. And I was, I heard that story at lunchtime and I was just like, damn, dad, I did not expect you to be that tough. Yeah, no shit, dude. It's, it's scary, dude. Those animals are scary. Like as much as I love horses, I didn't grow up with horses. So I grew up with like this naive, like all oh, horses are these docile, beautiful, giant, gentle giants. And not all of them, man. Horses can be fucking aggressive. I, I mm -hmm. did uh, one elective when I was in college, horseback riding like beginner horseback riding and I had to tackle a horse for the first time and put on all their gear, saddle and all that shit. And they gave me this old horse, like a 24 year old mm -hmm. horse and horses live like 25 to 30 years. So this is old ass horse. And they said that they use right. this horse to train all the new people that this is the new people horse. So this horse is like dealing with all the idiots like me that don't know what they're doing. So do it wrong. And so that right. pisses the horse off. So this horse like bit the shit out of me one day. And I was like, I knew horses bit. But I didn't think that they, like, just will fucking bite you before you even do anything wrong. Right. And this guy did, dude. He bit me, and it's just like a hard-ass pinch, and it hurt like a bitch. Luckily, I was wearing a coat. But the guy told me, he's like, yeah, that guy, that horse is mean. You got to bring him an apple. If you bring him an apple, he'll bite you less often. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, I don't like, want to sign up for that bargain. I, I was don't like, want... what? This is the, the biggest problem that I have with horses is... That when you feed them, you have to keep your hand flat. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to feed them an apple or a sugar cube or something, like it doesn't make sense. I'm too worried about the, shaking the thing and the, and the hand, you know, the thing falling off. I just want to hold it the way I would normally hold something and grip it. I don't want to feel with. I don't want to deal with an animal that's going to bite my fingers off. Yeah, clean off. Right. Don't no. need that in my life. No, I'm terrified of them now. Like, I wasn't afraid of horses until I actually worked with a horse. And then I was afraid. They're just so big. And once you're, like, riding one and there's no one with you, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. shit, I'm kind of, like, in a dangerous situation here. And it's, like, it's it's very underplayed. Like, it's underplayed how hard and dangerous it is to ride a horse. You only see yeah. it in the movies. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Texas. I went to the rodeo a few times, and I watched some kids who were really good at horseback riding at the camp I worked at. And it's just like, I mean, I've ridden a horse a few times, but I can't, like, ride a horse the way that some of these master horseback riders and cowboys can. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Texas. So this is a good time to take our break. We're at the 45-minute mark, so let's take our break. I'm going to go to the bathroom, fill up my coffee, and I'll come back in, like, less than five minutes. Okay, sounds good. And just let your recording keep going. You got it. All right. What's up, Pet Peeves Podcast listeners? If you or someone you know has a cat, and you notice this cat drinking from the bathroom sink or from the bathtub, it's because cats prefer cold, fresh, flowing water. Most people leave a bowl of water on the floor all day, and cats don't like to drink it. This causes a lot of cats to develop kidney diseases, later in their life. We'd like to recommend a plug-in automatic water fountain to our listeners. The Purr Power Pet Fountain is perfect for cats or dogs. It has a centralized fountain, which is great because we had one where it was on the side and my cat and dog would make a big mess. 
The sound of the water flowing will attract them to the fountain and they can drink fresh flowing water all day. It does come with a filter that needs to be cleaned and changed from time to time, similar to a Brita water filter. Use our Amazon affiliate link in the description to purchase the Per Power Pet Fountain and you will help support the Pet Peeves podcast. I recommend this for any pet owner out there who wants to prevent kidney failure and kidney problems in their cat or dog and for people who just want to get their cats out of the sink and out of the bathtub. Use the Amazon affiliate link in the description and help the Pet Peeves podcast grow. Thank you guys and let's get back to the episode. Hey everybody, thank you for checking out the commercial. If you listen to the commercial, we are still advertising the Your Power uh, pet water fountain. So we have a, a automatic plug-in pet water fountain that we advertise. You use a, a water fountain for your cats? Yeah, we got a little uh, little fountain that's got a flower on top that is oh, the yeah, thing that shoots those. the water out of. Yeah, that's the high selling one. We we promote one called the Your Power, but the flower one is great. I mean, as long as you got a fountain for your cats, if you're a cat owner out there, get a fountain. It's just better. Got to circulate that water, keep it fresh. Yeah, man. Keep it fresh, keep it flowing, and the sound of the water drip, dripping, drizzling. What's the word I'm looking for? Dripping, I think works. Flowing. Yeah, that attracts them to it. That's like, uh, yeah, that's why people flowing. People leave their faucets on, you know, so the cat can drink out of the faucet. Like, it's the same, same principle, except for you're not wasting water. There's a water crisis in California. Get a fountain. So the Europe Power... Never heard of a water cat fountain. drinking we out have of one, a faucet. We have one. It's awesome. No? Uh, I feel like we're having some no, internet never. slowdown. We are. That's hold okay. on. Okay. Let's try it again. There we go. How about this? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, cool. All right, so Texas. So the, this is a little background. We haven't talked anything spoken at all about uh, how we know each other. So a little background. I, I'm pretty sure I met you in, during show up, go up. I don't think I met you at Roast Battle. I think I knew you before that. No, I think I met you at like random open mics. Yeah, I think it was probably open mics. Yeah, because I Memory don't. serves. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I knew you well before I started doing the Roast Battle. But you were a door door guy at at the comedy store for a, a while, then, right? When when did you start as a door guy there? So I started working as a door guy in the summer of 2014, May 2014. So I guess it's late spring if you want to get technical. Um, I moved to LA. I had just graduated college. It was like fall of 2012. I worked at Flappers for a year and a half, and then I worked at the comedy store for about five years. I quit working there last uh, February. And so I was there for a long time. You know, it was a good, it was yeah. the longest, you know, stint at one job that I've ever had. Well, it's a pretty cool place to work, I imagine. But I, I, I met you I, somewhere in 2014 then, because I moved to LA in April of 2014. But I don't think I did stand up until August. I think I was still like trying to find a job. And then in August, I lived on Hollywood and La Brea, Hollywood and La Brea. And you lived with Frank, like right down the street from me. Yeah, we were at uh, Hollywood and Fuller. Yep. You lived like literally a two minute walk. Like I just had to cross the street and go to the corner and you guys lived right there. But I didn't know that for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I went over there one time. Do you remember that? Uh, vaguely. I was smoking yeah, a lot was, of weed back then. So I, but yeah. I, don't, I don't remember as much. Yeah, I was over there to sell you guys weed. I was uh, living at a grow op, and I had been smoking with everybody at the show up, go up after the shows because I lived at a house where we were growing. So I just had like tons of fucking weed all the time. And uh, I met Frank, and then he invited me over there, and it was you guys and uh, Josh Waldron name dropping people for smoking weed. I hope that's not a bad idea. Nah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Frank's comfortable with people knowing he smokes weed. Frank, Frank is a weed influencer at this point. Yeah. Frank's yeah. the guy, and I, I talk about smoking weed. I don't do it anymore, but, you know, I did it. I inhaled. Yeah. I got nothing to hide. Yeah, no, I was going to ask you about your sobriety, too. I had uh, Rebecca Rush on recently and Alex uh, Young, you know, and, and yeah. they talked about their sobriety, and I think it's a real interesting topic <clears throat> for comedians. And uh, so I want to get to that, but still, back to Texas. Texas. So where are you from in Texas? So I grew up uh, outside of Dallas. There's this suburb in between dallas and fort worth called colleyville it's basically just like a place where white people went to escape the city 
uh, a lot of a lot of people hanging out out there who were like fake rich or actually rich. A lot of gated communities full of people who are on opiates. <laughs> and uh, you know, I grew up out there. Uh, I I bounced around a lot before we landed there. My dad was in the Navy, so we were moving around because he was still enlisted. Uh, okay. But I spent pretty much all of my childhood in Colleyville. We moved there when I was eight, and I stayed there until I left for college. Okay, I understand. And uh, did you start doing stand-up in college? When did you start doing stand-up? Yeah, after college. college. I was in college, in college okay. yeah. I went to school in North Carolina. They awesome. they had a little scene out there, and it, it's really spread out. Every every scene, every city in North Carolina that had any sort of a comedy club or something, but pretty much every city in North Carolina has some sort of a comedy club. You know, that's so, awesome. I did not know that. Yeah, I went to school this little town uh, called Elon, and it was kind of smack dab in the middle of the state. Right next to Greensboro, which is like a 20 minute drive. They got a club out there called the Idiot Box. And then there's Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Durham. That's sort of the, they call it the triangle. And they okay. have a couple clubs out there. Uh, some of them no longer exist. Some of them still do. There's Good Nights. There's the, uh, the Pit, which I used to know as DSI. Um, and I was doing shows out there. And then I was doing shows on my college campus too. I started running a bar show. They had, a, there was an open mic that I would go to that was like pretty much all acoustic guitar kids and like English majors reading poems. And then I would read, I would tell jokes and, uh, yeah, it was pretty much it. How did that. you get into it? Where did stand up come from? Like all of a sudden you, somebody, you know, was doing it or how did it even well, spark your interest i had a really good friend of mine one of my best friends this guy <clears throat> you know we grew up going we we were theater kids and, and speech and debate kids so we performed together i always sort of had like the performer thing in me and i always loved comedy i would stay up really late watching comedy central and adult swim and i loved watching stand-up comics and then we went on a class trip to new york as the theater kid you know, like we all went to go see shows and hang out and learn about the the industry, I guess. Um, my senior year, and he bought the Comedy Bible, the Judy Carter book, when we were yeah, out there. I have it. Yeah. And so we started, he, because it says in the book, you need a comedy buddy if you're going to start doing stand-up. So I volunteered. And so we started writing jokes. And then, you know, I was 18. So then I did my first open mic that fall. So it was October. I I was really scared, of course, after the first, you know, couple years, I didn't really do a ton. I didn't really count those in my time in total just because I maybe did 10 open mics total those first two years. I understand. But by the time I was a junior in college, I was 20 years old, I had a car, and I was like, you know what? I I really like doing this. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna I, I'm gonna keep at it and actually like try and figure out how the scene works here in North Carolina. I was starting to perform more regularly, and then I really started giving a shit about it. And then when I graduated, I was like, it's either moving to L.A. or New York. I had a film degree, so I figured L.A., I could work some, like, PA jobs and come out here. And uh, I and I wound up doing none of that stuff and just working at comedy clubs instead. And uh, that's, how, that's how it all worked out. No, that's awesome, man. I think uh, a lot of people did that, got the Comedy Bible and got a comedy buddy. And I don't know if there is a better way to do it, but it definitely helps to not have to do that shit by yourself yeah well it's it's nice to have somebody to keep you accountable you know mm -hmm. like we would get together even we we didn't go to school together in college but we were getting on the phone with each other you know every week or every couple weeks and having phone calls and saying hey all right what jokes do you have what have you write what have you written that's new have you done any open mics this week how'd they go what happened did you record your sets did you listen back to them and and it was nice to have at especially that early on, somebody to hold you accountable. Cause that's the kind of thing that you find as you go on, maybe the people who you hang out with in comedy changes and the sure. people who are holding you accountable for your jokes changes, but you, uh, it's always nice to have at least one or two people who you can trust their sense of humor and bounce off of like, all right, this is a good idea. This idea may be not great, but here, let's figure out how we can make it work. Yeah, so for sure. I had like have that. go to friends and I, one of my cousins that I would like before I was the same as you. When I first started doing stand up, I probably did 
maybe 30 open mics in three years. Like I would do maybe 10 a year. So it's like 10 open mics. So it's like 30 minutes total in a year. So I don't really count Mm -hmm. that. But in those times, I would pitch jokes to my friends in the living room before I would take them to the open mic because I didn't know anything about stand up. That was like the show. The open mic was the show. I didn't know how to get booked or what a feature was or any of that. It was, you know, the first documentary I saw that actually taught me about stand up was uh, I Am Comic. You know, this one? Oh, I love I Am Comic. Yeah, that's a a classic. Yeah, that one actually, I was like, oh, it it was like an eye opener. It was before like Joe Rogan, you know, could Mm -hmm. walk you through it. So I didn't do a lot in the beginning, but I did like in my living room, pitch to my friends, my little jokes, those jokes that later on got laughs that got me booked on real shows. So I was like, you need those few, like, those few living room jokes that you can turn into a real bit in the beginning is what gives you confidence that you could do that over and over again. Yeah, that's the thing. It's I, I always approached comedy even before I was really doing it a lot, and especially those first two years of college. I was a big student of comedy, you know. So I did all the the reading the books. You know, I didn't. I, n- I actually have never read the comedy bible in full, but I've have you know. I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. I've got Zen and the Art of Stand-Up Comedy by Jay Sankey. I've got uh, uh, And Here's the Kicker by Mike Sachs. And I've got, you know, uh, memories of watching Comedian, the Jerry Seinfeld and Orny Adams documentary and over and over again. Mm-hmm. I Am Comic. Uh, there's this special on the History Channel called History of the Joke that I watched over and over again. Watched a lot of stand-up specials. It's yeah. just the stuff that, like, I had to figure out and absorb all this stuff and then write and, you know, I kept the moleskin notebook with me at all times, the little pocket notebook, and write all my jokes down. And some of them were really bad, and some of them were really uh, – and some of them worked out to be pretty decent. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. I mean, that's that's got to be the process for most people, I imagine. You got to just – Get get the good ideas down on notepad, especially when you got when you're young and you guys are just getting started doing stand up. Anybody out there who's new to it, like if you're not sitting everywhere with your little notebook in the beginning, obsessed with it, watching stand up, watching documentaries about stand up, reading books about stand up, it's like how else are you gonna learn what stand up really is? Because in the beginning you think you know what it is, and then the more you do it and do it and do it, and the better you get at it, you're like, oh shit, there's way more to it than I ever thought. And I'm sure. How did you get the job at the comedy store? I was, was basically in the right place at the right time. When I first moved to LA, I had started, I, I was driving from Texas to Los Angeles. It's like a three day drive, right? And I listened to pretty much the whole drive through WTF episodes where Mark Marin was talking to, in particular, comedy store guys. And I had never really heard of the comedy store at all. You know, we never went there. Uh, I, I went to LA a couple times before I moved here, and I'd never thought about doing stand up as like a career, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, I start to listen about like, I, I have this idea in my head of like, okay, I wanna do comedy, I wanna do stand up. I don't know what that really looks like in Los Angeles. But I know that that's what I want to do. And so then I pick up listening to these WTF episodes and I hear it's comics like Don Barris was one of the episodes, Kevin Christie, and and they're talking about their time at the comedy store. Obviously, Marin has his whole history with being a door guy and leaving and coming back. So they're talking about the comedy store and it sounds like this place that I'm like, oh, I want to go there. Like, I want to be a part of that place. And I remember... I was so intimidated to even go hang out there for the first couple years that I, or for not first couple years, first couple months that I was here. I didn't go until like two or three months after I moved here to Potluck for the very first time. And then I went there and I just felt like the neat, like just something about the place like sucked me in, like the neons and the, the vibe. I was like, this is, this is the place. I got to be a part of this place. It took me a while to break in. I was working at Flappers, like I said. I worked there for about a year and a half before I got sure. the job at the store. And I, uh, yeah, I didn't uh, know that. I didn't know you worked at Flappers first. That's cool. I did. Yeah. And I worked, uh, I got it, you know, I would go Mondays off every, every Monday at Flappers. I would go to hang out and do potluck and sign up for potluck and sign up for Kill Tony. Right. Got up in potluck a handful of times, got up on Kill Tony a handful of times, started to hang out there more. Frank and I became friends at that time. And he came and told me, you know, he'd bring other comedy store guys with him. And he came and told me about the roast battle open mic when it was still an open mic. 
And uh, I remember after that, I started hanging out there more and hanging out on Tuesdays. And I got to know Moses that way and the Roast Battle crew. And then one day I did uh, this guy, Jay Mannium. I did Potluck. And Jay Mannium was working at the store still. And he's another guy from Dallas. Yeah. And he was looking out for me. And he said, uh, hey, you know, there's, a, there's an opening for a door guy job at the store if you want it. And... Uh, if you do, you should talk to Tommy. And so I had a, a day off from the comedy store or from Flappers that week. So I went to hang out at the comedy store. It was like a Thursday night and Tommy was there. I had never talked to him before. He was intimidating. Sure. I'd only known him from like documentaries podcasts and, and stuff. Podcasts. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I was like, all right, I'm going to talk to this guy. And I talked to him. And I remember I said, like, I said hi to him. He was working the cover booth of the OR, and I told him I was a comic. And he was like, oh, yeah, I think I saw you on Potluck the other day. Uh, you know, you got you got a good energy about you. And I was like, oh, thanks. He's like, I was like, cool. And then I went and watched the show. And I hung out for a while, and then I left. And on my way out, I went up to him again. I was like, hey, man, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys are hiring, but I'd love to work here as a door guy. You know, I I feel like I I it would be really good to work here, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, you know that, that might work out. Come back here on Monday, and we'll work you out again." So I came back the next Monday. He put me up on potluck again, and then I came back a couple. You know, I basically took the rest of that week off from flappers, just hanging out at the store, getting to know people a little bit. Fuck yeah, I, and then the next week they put me up on potluck again, and then at the end of that week. I got a call from uh, Tommy that I was getting hired. Hell yeah, that's an awesome story. Yeah, and I was the last guy he ever hired before he got fired. He got I, hired. Yeah, I was about to say, it couldn't yeah. have been long after. Yeah, Frank got hired, and then uh, it was me a couple weeks after Frank. We were the last two guys he ever hired, and then he got fired in August of that year. And uh, we just, you know, we stuck it out. We lasted there, and it wound up being the best time, I think, since the 80s to work at the comedy store. Oh, fuck yeah. It's a good oh, run. Yeah, definitely, man. I, I came in at the right time. I mean, when I first came, it was Tommy. And then Tommy was let go. And I I met Tommy at uh, Next Stage Theater. Remember they were doing shows yeah. over there at Next Stage? And Tommy would let us audition for him. And he would give us, like, notes. Did you did you ever do that? I did that a couple times. And I remember he would do he, he did the Next Stage one. And then I remember he was doing the one at the place, the Valcluse Lounge down the street. You remember that? What's it called? The Valcluse Lounge is like the chaplain's house open mic. Sounds familiar. I don't remember. Yeah. I remember he was there and he would always tell me, he's like, I'm really glad to see you like doing well and doing good things at the store. I was glad that you got hired. I was glad that, to, you know, I feel like I made the right choice. I was like, okay, cool. So it, it felt cool to to still know like, you know, I, I don't have a bad thing to say about Tommy Morris. I know there are other people who have a complicated relationship with the guy, but you know, he gave me a, a, my dream job when yeah. I really needed it. And I was It seems like yeah. situational, your relationship with him. Obviously, I have no idea. But when I met him, he was cool to me. He gave me great advice. He said I was funny, which makes me feel great. He told me that I was funny. So I was like, well, I could, you know, I could take that as real fucking somebody who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And I needed a, a job like that at a time like that. It was at a weird yeah. spot in my life. So hey, I'm it worked glad out for that me. it worked out. Yeah. You were there, so now I got you here, and uh, you were a big part of my my roast battle, you know, life. You were you were always there, and you were always giving me great advice, and you were just like always supportive of me, and I really appreciate that. You know, obviously the roast battle changed my whole comedy life. You know, my comedy life was not had nothing to do with roast battle. You know what I mean? Prior mm -hmm. to roast battle, so then after that, it was just like, oh, I just had so many more opportunities after that. People are like, oh, he could do more than just one thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that's that's all you kind of need, and not just in. LA. So I went back to Indiana and obviously, you know, you go back to Indiana and, and all those people are obsessed with what goes on at the comedy store and obsessed with roast battle. So I was given all these opportunities and it was great to That's use, great. to use those opportunities to uh, get a lot of stage time. So I always appreciate you for that. Cause I know you would push for me and uh, yeah, I appreciate it, man. And that it was always uh, something I never really got to talk to you outside of the comedy store. This is not the best <laughs> the best format either i guess over digital oh, this but. is a good format though it's nice you know it's it, it's always glad to hear because i know that for me and for the the sort of community that built around roast battle it was a very important show and it's a thing that i attribute a lot of my 
success to and and not just because I was afforded opportunities because of being on the show and doing well on the show, but because of the way it affected the how I perform and how I write jokes and how I perceive myself. Absolutely. And if I didn't have roast battle in my life as as something to help me develop comedically in a certain way, then I have I, I have a hard time picturing what my uh, my my feelings about comedy and where I would be would would ultimately look like. You know, I'm sure I'd probably find some level of success, hopefully, but sure. it would look different than the way it does now. You know, yeah, I, I, no, I, have, I think. It was a lot of right place, right time. You know, it was like the energy was right. The comedy store was popping again. All of us were like doing it just for the love because it was a small show in the beginning, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the thing too of like, I remember Roast Battle to me, it's in into, you know, it's right there in the name uh, or the tagline sort of. It's the Joke Writer Showcase, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Roast Battle showed that for a lot of comics it's like all right this is not only a place where like you you can do stand up sure fine but you can write jokes that's a fucking commodity yes and, and that's a trade that you can sell beyond just being a good comic absolutely that's what it, it taught me how to write a bunch of jokes about a topic with a deadline and that's yeah. something that you don't have with stand up with stand up it's so, it. it's so flu fluid you could pretty much do whatever you want yeah but Rose can, Battle, it's more like you're you are writing the script and then you have to memorize the script and then you have to edit and aud call audibles in the middle and it's all about how well you wrote the jokes. Like if you wrote them really well, it's going to come out great and you're going to win. Right, exactly. And hey, even if you didn't write them uh, to the point where you're going to win, you know you can still put on a good show. And that's yeah, you're not always. You're going to win in quotations, as in you put on a good show. Your your jokes are going to get laughs. People. The comedians afterwards are going to be like, wow, that was a fucking great joke. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's part of the reason why I included a roast battle on my new album. You know, I think that it's a specific kind of art form, but I attribute a lot of how I think about comedy now to my time as a part of roast battle. Yeah. Tell me about your album. You put some, some roast battle on there. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, it's a it's a roast battle right in the middle. We got sketches and we got stand up. I worked with Coach T. Speaking of roast battle, worked with Coach T on uh, on producing the album. He worked his magic in there, and uh, it's called Good Guy with a Gun. I feel really good about it. You know, I've, I've been doing stand up almost ten years now. I recorded it all last year, and I just felt like okay, I want to do something. I want to put down some of this material that I've been doing for such a long time that I love, but I'm getting bored of and oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not feeling like it's me anymore to keep saying it. So I was like, what can I do to make sure that this material doesn't feel stale and that I don't just come off like just some other white guy telling jokes. Right. So right. I talked to coach a lot about it conceptually and we figured out a way to make the album feel like me where it's got some elements to it that are surprising and you don't expect. And, I think it's it it's more than just somebody, some white guy telling jokes. Like I remember this has always stuck with me. I took this improv class a long time ago with this teacher, Emily Candini, and she told me that you can't just be another guy wearing a plaid shirt and glasses who's just trying to be funny. Mm -hmm. Like there's those are a dime a dozen now. And I took that to heart and I really tried to, that's something that like has stuck with me since then. I've tried to co conceive of myself and help, you know, push the way I do comedy in a way that doesn't just fall into that vein. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job, man. You're, you're funny and you don't see, you don't remind me of other comedians and none of that shit. So Thanks, whatever, man. whatever you're, you that's a high to, compliment. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I mean it. And you, and I could see someone meeting you and being like, oh, this motherfucker's probably corny, but you're not, you're not, you're, you're like a breath of fresh air for a white guy comic. <laughs> Thanks, man. That, that means a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen you be corny or cheesy, like honestly, and it's not just roast battle. I've seen you do a lot of stand up, And so it's, you know, I believe in you. It's, I, it's, it's funny. Cause there are definitely like, there are times on the album where I'm doing jokes that like, cause I, I love like. You know, a lot of the, the my sense of humor is sort of like dark and weird, but I also have moments where I can play into like a very dumb joke, like just stupid jokes. Sure. There's, there's like some of the dumbest 
like puns and wordplay I think I've ever said out loud or on that <laughs> album, but it's just like also tempered with some of the material on there that that I still think are like some of my favorite jokes, just for like the the fact that I was able to say these things and make them funny. I feel good about being able to have pulled that off. Well, where can I find it, man? I want to hear it. So the album is available exclusively on Pandora until August 14th when it is released everywhere. You can get it for pre-order now. If you're somebody who buys albums, you can buy it on iTunes or Amazon. Uh, I think there's a couple other stores, but it's available on everything starting August 14th. Pandora exclusive for now. SiriusXM's also got it. Um, but all of the, the social media for it, uh, for me at least, is where you can find the specific links for it. I'm at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram. JLightComedy.com uh, also has some links too. I'm gonna definitely pick it up. I'm gonna I'm gonna get it and I'm gonna listen to it because it sounds really interesting. So you you put in sketches and roast battle and stand up. Yeah. Damn, you went hard. That's awesome. So you Thanks, did. A, you put in just like you roasting somebody. Who did you put in? It's me versus Nicole Buchanan. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, that, uh, that one that happened like maybe six months ago? Yeah, it was like November of last year. Yeah, I was there. That was fucking awesome. It was one of my favorite battles. I love Nicole. She is a top-notch joke writer and a, and a wonderful roast battler and uh, a great comic. And she opened for me on the album recording, too. Her, Stephen Randolph, Ian Zandi. But I I knew, you know, Nicole and I have been friends and for a long time, and I... I I wanted to battle her for a long time too, but I figured this would be the perfect chance to showcase uh, uh, what a great battle looks like because I knew that Nicole would bring it. Hell yeah. And you guys it did exactly that, you know, cause I haven't, I didn't live in LA for two and a half years. So mm -hmm. roast battle changed a lot in that two and a half years. It's not oh, the yeah. same show. So when I came back, I was like, Whoa, this is really different energy, really different crowd, really different you know, like even to format, like even the formatting is different. So it's like, okay, what, what have I gotten myself into? Then I watched a couple of battles of people that I didn't know. Like I didn't know any of these people. And then you guys got up there and I'm like, oh, phew. There's, they, they still remember, <laughs> they, still, they still know how to do it. It's not over. You know, it's still, there's still people doing it the right way. Right. But I, I just think there's a lot of, I don't know, it's just kind of got, change it's just different you know you, when you're an old person you you don't like change it's like no this isn't music anymore you know you're just like oh I, the good old days i think it was just the good old days because everybody like was friends up there on a roast battle night it wasn't like sold seats it was like everybody and their friends hanging out and going crazy yeah i mean those were the glory days man when you used to be able to just go hang out up there and and just watch and the the crowd would pour out from the belly room into the yeah. parking lot yeah different times dude yeah and i mean change is always good evolution and people are getting jobs off of it now so i'm always gonna you know choose the what's better for the masses than what's better for me and everybody that i got to see on tv while i was in indiana when i was in indiana i never thought i was coming back to la i thought i was stuck there my wife has a kid i'm a stepfather he was in high school we were waiting to see what was going to happen with his life you know i'm from there she, my wife is from texas i don't, I don't want to forget to mention that she's from el paso Oh, really? I yeah, didn't know that. I think you guys have met. Yeah, yeah Rose Battles. You guys have definitely met. But I've yeah, met your wife. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know she was from uh, from Texas, though. Yeah, she's El Paso, and that's why she, she definitely likes Texas people. And we, we went to Texas not too long ago. I went to El Paso. It was pretty, pretty cool, man. It's very Mexican. Very. I mean, it's right there on the border, you know? Yeah. It was cool, though. I liked, I liked the vibe, but, you know, she, she is from there, so I got to see where she's from. She knows where I'm from. I met my wife in Indiana in 2005, but... She lived in Texas till she was like 20. Yeah. Gotcha. And yeah. So you guys will have to talk Texas, but it was, you know, it's a, it's a big fucking place. So I'm guessing Huge. what Dallas is nowhere near El Paso, right? It's got no, like dude, it's two to time zones away. away. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I think uh, the first day that I drove, because it's a multiple day drive to leave, right? Yeah. I drove from Dallas to, uh, I think I stopped in Albuquerque, maybe. Okay. Okay. And it was yeah. like a 13 hour drive and about nine of those hours were in Texas. Yeah. And it's... you jump into a different time zone going to El Paso. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We, we drove to, to and from El Paso from here, from LA. And it's not that bad because El Paso is on the very Western fucking edge tip of Texas. So it's like you get through fucking Arizona and you're there. 
Uh, it's it's very surreal that drive, especially because it's just like every Texas has it's so big, right? It has this huge landscape change too. Like North Texas is all very woodsy, and then you get the hill country, and then but West Texas is just flat, fucking gross desert. I didn't. I hadn't seen tumbleweeds in person until I drove through West Texas. Yeah, it's weird. It's like the old West. Do you ever think about going back to Texas? Yeah. Not really. I mean, um, I like Austin a lot, but I, I, I couldn't see myself moving back to Texas. Yeah, I can't see it was myself like going an back absolute to Indiana. Necessity. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm pretty happy not being in Indiana. But I didn't live in Indiana for a long time. Now it's probably been since 2008, 2009 yeah. that I've lived in Indiana. I mean, I spent so much of my adult life trying to just survive enough to not have to move back to Texas and move back in with my parents that, you know, I'm glad I succeeded in pulling that off. But I would feel like at this point, if I did go back, it would be I've still got that same mindset of like, oh, OK, I did. I, I don't want to do this. It feels like I know this is all me. This is my own perception of it. But it's like I'm going back home with my tail between my legs. It is kind of like that if you don't want to go back. There's nothing wrong with going home if you want to go home. But if you don't want to go home and you, like, have no choice, that's pretty defeating, especially, like, as a, a male, maybe. I feel like my wife doesn't doesn't look at it the same way, like, going home to your parents as I do. So maybe it's maybe it's just me. I don't know. Who knows? But I would. I mean, like... I would if I had to. Like, I don't hate my mom. You know what I mean? Like, my parents are divorced. So if I had to go live with my mom, it wouldn't completely suck. I wouldn't feel like a complete failure, but it definitely wasn't the plan. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wouldn't want to do it. My mom act it was for a while actively trying to get me when I first moved to, to L.A. and I was, you know, doing the struggling artist thing. My mom was like, come back home or move back in, move back to Austin or something or, or you know, because Austin is like three hours from Closer. from Dallas, so it's close at least. Mm -hmm. But I also have tried to live since I got out of the house to live a life where my parents can't just drop in on me unexpectedly. Like I need to have some forewarning. Some space, yeah. Yeah. So being in LA, being in North Carolina gives me that sort of yeah, okay yeah you got to book plane tickets if you want to come out here you can't just hop on the 35 and drive down have they been here your parents have they come out here to see you do roast battle and stuff yeah yeah they, I, think, I think i knew that yeah they've come out to la a little bit they saw me do the roast battle season one taping in austin at cap oh, city that, yeah that's fucking cool that you're on that yeah my grandma saw that too that was fun yeah, see, shit like that, man. It's got to be fun. My, yeah. my mom's never got to see me do anything super cool. My mom saw me win an Indiana comedy contest about three there years ago. Go. There you go. I beat like nine people. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. But other than that, my mom is what? I don't know. She's, she's seen my special. That's about it. Yeah, my mom, uh, uh, my dad is a, definitely, I think, a bigger fan of my comedy in general than my mom is because I... I think my mom's sense of humor is not quite as uh, as dark as mine is. <laughs> and my dad is a surgeon, so I have a former Navy guy, so I feel like he's got a little bit more gallows humor than, uh, than he lets on about. Um, like, my mom, listen, she told me the first track of my album is a sketch, and uh, it's about a mom catching her son masturbating and confessing to the priest about it. Yeah. And it's loosely based on stuff that happened. It's not a you know, it's not a word for word rip, and it's it's just me. It's just a sketch. It's based um, on a true story. So, very loosely based on a true story. But my mom told me she was like, I listened to that first track, and uh, and I was like, <laughs> it's oh boy, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't listen to the rest of the album, mom. But it's just jokes, you know. That's the way. It, that's what it is. All at the it's end truth. of the day, it's uh, truth and jokes. It's exact. And I've had to. I tell my mom this. You know, with all love, my comedy is not necessarily for you. And just <laughs> keep that in mind. I have this joke in my uh, special about my mom hitting us when we were kids. And my oh, mom yeah? was like, she told me that it hurt her feelings. And I was like, well, it hurt me more when I was a kid. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> she, she like, I told her, because she had to get over it, obviously. The special's out there. But she did eventually. It's like, mom, it, it happened. You know what I mean? You're that, it's not that big of a deal. It happened. It's over. Everybody's fine. And it's funny. People people really like it. It's really funny. So I think moms, I don't know, they just got to listen to the whole thing. You got to listen to the whole thing, not just the, the parts that offend you. Listen to the whole thing. Get listen through the, the masturbation thing. jokes. Get through those jokes that you don't like. And there's got to be some in there that you do like. You got you to gotta do it, man. And that's the thing. It's like, 
I, I think for some portions of time, especially like if, if people get weird about family stuff sometimes about like if it's re a reflection on them, but it's just like, listen, I'm making a joke about it. I, I, I'm not mad or right. anything. It's just the way, it's just how, you know, we're comics, right? We, we absorb our traumatic experiences yeah, you're or right experiences what you, know. you feel weird about. And then we turn it into jokes, right? Yeah. We're not doing it with malice. No, I'm actually like, it's cathartic. Like after writing the jokes about it, I don't feel so bad about it. It's like, yeah, that, whatever it happened. And now it made me who I am and I'm able to do what I love. So here we are. Exactly. And before, okay, so I want to start wrapping up. And before we go on to the next segment, Guam Felix has posted a question. What's up, Guam? Fellow, What's up, Guam? Fellow ex-co-worker from you. Guam is uh, super fucking cool. Door guy at the comedy store. He asks, can dogs and cats get COVID from humans? And what's the best way to get rid of fleas on your pets? Okay, dogs and cats get COVID. Dogs and cats cannot get COVID. No. From humans, no. But they could be carriers in, like, weird situations if someone sneezes or coughs on your dog or your cat or your dog or cat walks where somebody just sneezes and they have covid they could carry it and give it to a person but it's just like super highly unlikely i think that they found one positive tiger somewhere and then people started freaking out oh, okay uh, yeah i've seen something you know how easy it is to like see something in passing on the internet and just oh, be yeah. like oh god what did I see? And I saw something like that about like, you know, the second wave of COVID is going to be carried by cats and dogs. And I was like, oh, God. Yeah, I haven't heard any real quarantine our cats evidence towards. I mean, besides the obvious, like I said, if you if your dog or cat is around someone who has COVID and then you're are petting the dog and then you touch your face, could you get COVID? Sure. Sure. But, you know, like if you have somebody in your house who has COVID, you can get the COVID from anything, not just the pet. Touching the same right. door handle, using the same remote control, using the same keyboard, any of that stuff. But mostly it's like breathing the same air next to each other. So mm -hmm. as long as you're not like putting your dog's face in your mouth after your dog was just making out with your COVID positive friend. Right. You should be all right. But, you know, people do like to let dogs and cats lick their face and, you know, they French kiss their dogs. So it depends what kind of modern family you guys. Everybody making out with the dog? Maybe... <laughs> Maybe get it COVID tested. Maybe yeah. If you're a furry and you don't <laughs> get to hang out with other furries right now, and you're French kissing your dog to make up for that, and you got COVID, may, just double check. Go double get some check. tests. Go get tested. Go get tested. Oh, I'm getting tested later today. Speaking of which, I've already been tested twice. Negative. Two negatives. Hey, same here, dude. Nice, nice. I gotta get another test soon. Probably I should uh should double check just to make sure. I try and keep things pretty pretty safe but i've taken i guess i've taken three tests one of them was an antibody test and i tested negative for that too um, i haven't done any of those yeah i got i got hit up by a market research company that i signed up for emails for when i was looking for cash okay. and they were giving out gift cards to anybody who took an antibody test so i was like all right sweet sign up for that and then i've done the dodger stadium drive through testing a couple times yeah we're gonna do the forum today we live like across the street from the forum nice all right, so Guam's other question. How, what's the best way to get rid of fleas on your pets? I mean, the prescription flea meds, the oral pills work the best. Or, uh, you know, there's topical ones that work really good, like the ointments you put on their, between the shoulder blades. Those work really well. The prescription ones work the best. The ones that you need, a veterinary prescription, a, a physical exam. You can get the ones from the store, like PetSmart or Petco or Costco, and they have Frontline and Frontline Plus. And those work okay. The fleas in Southern California are pretty aggressive. So the, the key ingredient, the active ingredient in, in Frontline doesn't, doesn't work as well as the box says. The box says that it'll work for a month, four weeks. But it really only works for about two weeks. So if you're, oh, buying, yeah, if you're buying the over-the-counter stuff, you're just going to have to buy twice as much. So then you worry about over, you know, overdosing your animal on accident. And it's pretty safe drug. But some animals have crazy reactions to it, especially cats. So a lot of people don't like the topical because some pets react to it. So they think it hurts. Uh, but they, it's just like tingly is the way we've been described by the, the manufacturers when we get our little demos when they come with the new products. They say it doesn't hurt the cats or dogs. It just tingles. So they freak out. Whatever. So the best way to get rid of fleas is actually getting the prescription flea and tick preventative from a veterinarian. Now, if you want to do a, a flea bath and over-the-counter, that'll work somewhat, 
but you're still going to have fleas in the environment. The fleas lay eggs. Those eggs live in your environment for months and months. So unless you're keeping your animal on flea preventative throughout the entire year, eventually when your animal's flea preventative wears off, the eggs in the environment are going to hatch. And they're going to jump on your pet. They're going to start the cycle all over again. So it's just, it's a hard cycle to break with over the counter. It's a lot easier if you just buy them from the vet and stick with it for the entire year until you break through that flea life cycle. The flea life cycle is long. It's months to years. Sometimes they could stay cocooned and hibernating in these eggs. So you just got to do your research, vacuum, 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 throw away shit. Like if you got rugs and stuff like that and your pet has fleas, throw that shit away because the flea eggs are in there and no matter how much you vacuum, you're not going to get rid of all of them. Or keep your pet on flea preventative all year round. That's your other option. And eventually all the flea eggs will hatch and they'll bite your pet and they'll die and they won't lay new eggs. So that's the other way to break the cycle. Damn. All right. Yeah, it's not easy. Like flea powders and flea collars and all that shit kind of works, but it doesn't do anything for the fleas in the environment. The flea eggs that your pet spreads all over the apartment or the house when they walk around and shake and all that shit go under the furniture. They're dropping little flea eggs everywhere that hatch months later. All right, so the last segment is uh, about uh, eating animals. How do you feel about eating animals? I got no problem with eating animals. No I, problem? Texas boy? Yeah, Texas boy, baby. Um, I mean, I've been trying to be more conscious about the way I eat animals these days. Uh, my girlfriend is vegetarian. I keep, okay. I keep, I, over my whole life, every pretty much every girlfriend I've had has been a vegetarian. So wow. I'm no stranger to the- The lifestyle. Uh, the lifestyle. Uh, during COVID, especially since we've been cooking and eating at home a lot more, I've eaten a lot more vegetarian meals. So now I'm, I, I wouldn't say that I'm like out there trying to eat meat all the time. Uh, but I do see like, oh, okay, maybe I should have a meat as like every once in a while. And I do try and be conscious, you know, I, I like to, uh, if I'm, if I'm going to get some meat, you know, I would rather buy like grass fed, right. Or like, you know, cage free, free range right. eggs and that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to be a little bit more conscious about the meat that I eat, but I got no problem with eating meat at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, no, we're big eat meaters. My wife and I, we're fucking carnivores, omnivores. We eat tons of fucking meat. Mexican food, man. You can't, it's hard to be vegan or vegetarian with Mexican food. It is. Oh difficult. yeah. Unless you're getting like chili rellenos all the time. It's just yeah. not. Or like soy chorizo or stuff like that. And it's optional. Like I, just like you, I once had a vegan girlfriend and she taught me a lot. Like I didn't even know that vegan chorizo, like soy chorizo existed. I didn't know that they put like, you know, uh, chicken broth or stuff like that in food. So then vegans can't eat that either. I never yep. would have considered chicken broth anti-vegan or whatever, not vegan. So little things like that I learned. And then I tried all these different vegan meals that were fucking delicious. So I was yeah. like, oh man, I, it totally turned my, my perspective around about what being a vegan actually meant. But yeah. now my, my wife and I, we, we try like you to be conscious of the meat that we eat, try our best to do the free range and the, 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 the grass fed and all that if we can. But in general, I'll pretty much eat street food and, you know, taco trucks and all that shit. Like, I, Oh my, yeah. My I'll bar is pretty low, truck. but at the same time, I do feel like our whole culture is moving towards less meat. And that's kind of what the question I have for the people on the podcast, for my guests, it's like, do you, do you think that it's morally irresponsible the way that we we eat meat now and market meat now? Is it morally irresponsible? Well, I do think that, I mean, the science is there that meat production and farming in that, uh, at the level that meat is farmed now is the mass production, bad right? for the environment. The factory farming. Right. The factory farming is bad for the environment. That you can't, you can't ignore that. So I think that pursuing... Uh, a, a lifestyle where you're eating less meat that is factory farmed and where you're, uh, you know, doing things like, oh, okay, instead of eating a regular burger, I'll eat an impossible burger instead, right? Yeah, or every once in a eating, while. Yeah, I'll eat like the soy, I'll, I'll eat soy riso, right? I'll eat, there's some really good grain meat sausages that I like instead of, I used to get Italian sausages from making like pasta, but there's the, we have these great grain meat sausages that we get from the sprouts and you just grill them up and they taste they taste great. They oh, taste yeah. like sausage. No, we we like we have tried to go uh, vegan from time to time. Like we went vegan for a couple of months, and we tried all these different vegan re recipes and 
And it was not bad. You get creative and you find stuff that you like and there's always something delicious. So now when I go to a restaurant, you know, the vegan menu is open to me. The mm-hmm. the vegetarian menu is open to me. When before, I would ignore it like I ignore country music in a jukebox. You know what I right. mean? I think that people get kind of passive whenever they hear... You know, like, oh, okay, well, if if I eat, if, you know, what, what you're trying to get me to stop eating meat, you know, but if this is a problem that's bigger than me, I can't do anything about it. But you can, you know, you can take your own, like, personal action into account, and you can, and, and you can be a part of the change, right? Like, you can be somebody who takes those steps and is conscious about those steps instead of just saying, oh, I'm not important enough. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. So it, it just... It taking the opening yourself to being like, oh, okay, yeah, I won't eat meat as much as I used to, or at least I'll be like sort of trying to pick and choose to be more careful about the kind of meat that I get if I'm going to eat meat. That that does so much more than you think it does. And that is the most important change to make, I think. No, I think so too. Just being conscious. And I think uh, if you're an animal lover, I think maybe it's a little easier to have a tangible reason why you want to eat less meat. But even if you aren't an animal lover, you should be able to look at the factory farming situation and be like, yeah, that's not the best way to care for animals. And probably happy animals taste better, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, And uh, man, I was going to ask you just because it it kind of popped up in my head and I forgot to ask you earlier. Do you think like, say you said your girlfriend is vegan or vegetarian? Vegetarian. So she has, is she also sober? Uh... No, she's, I mean, she doesn't really, like, drink a ton. She has, uh, you know, I have, like, a bottle of wine around the house that she'll mm. drink every every night, every uh, now and again, a couple nights a week. And she doesn't do, you know, she doesn't, like, smoke pot or do drugs or anything. So but she's you guys have that in common where she, she's not eating meat, you're not partaking in drugs or alcohol. Do you feel like, uh, and maybe I'm seeing this wrong, this comparison, uh, but that like self discipline that it takes, do you think that it's similar? Like the discipline that it would take to stop eating meat would be the same kind of discipline to not drink or do drugs? No, I don't think so because I've never felt like I've never blacked out from eating too much meat. This is true, but some people I'd, could get like heart attacks from eating too much red meat and shit like that. Yeah, but I think that that Say is you also were morbid, like, morbidly obese. <laughs> if I was morbidly obese, it's a health choice, right? Like there for me, what, what I quit drinking and and sobered up, that was sort of a health choice, but it wasn't like a physical health choice so much. That was a byproduct. It became, it became, I became healthier because of that, but it was like a mental health choice. Okay, good. It was because I, I, yeah. So, and that's the thing with like, I've never felt crazy for eating meat. And I think that if you want to do it to to live a healthier physical lifestyle, by all means, go for it. But I do think it requires a different kind of discipline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because of I see. Yeah, like because there are certainly stigmas. I think because of like advertising about the way that we look at meat and the way that we look at alcohol. You know, burgers are made to look super cool, and steaks are made to look super fucking great, and in commercials. You know, it's the same with drinking. Drinking's made like to look super commercial. great and fun. Right, yeah. yeah. And sure, that might be the case sometimes, but like, you know, not everybody's going to feel that way about eating meat. Not everybody's going to feel that way when they drink, and that's just how it is. Yeah, that's what, what I meant. I think it's kind of, uh, in my mind, just about self-discipline because, you know, in the same frame, I tell myself, oh, I should drink less. I should smoke less weed. And not like I smoke a lot or drink a lot. I really don't, but it's just in... As a somebody who likes to achieve goals, sometimes when I'm not where I think I should be, I blame it on my little, uh, my vices, which is fine. I think that's what vices are there for sometimes. So you have things to blame it on. Uh, but maybe take those vices away, less, less places to blame, you'll get more accomplished. But yeah. I, I do find it hard for me to not eat shitty meat. Like I could avoid the taco truck. I could avoid the, the, the shitty options at McDonald's, but I crave it. Just like I crave the alcohol and crave the the weed. It's mm-hmm. like I wonder if it's the same part of the brain. I guess it is. Just like a dick shit. You're you get the to. reward. You know, you get yeah. the dopamine hit from. I get the dopamine hit from eating a, a fucking quarter pounder the Absolutely. same way I do whenever I I do something that feels nice. Like I went for a run before we recorded today, yeah. and I feel great for. Yeah, I was gonna say run. that's awesome. Is that something that started after your sobriety? You started uh, working out and stuff more, or was that always a part? 
It was always a part. I used to get high and go for runs a lot. Sure. That's pretty awesome. I do it. Yeah. It was really, I mean, that's the thing too. It's like, I mean, I, I quit drinking for uh, a while before I had quit smoking too. Like oh, I, okay. I, I was still doing some uh, little smoking. I would still get paranoid, but that's the thing. It's like the way I, a lot of that came to down to the way that I was approaching those behaviors and, and using those substances. And it's, yeah, I feel it's the kind of thing where like, you know, in 12 step world, right. Where they, they'll say stuff like you, it's a fit, you have a physical allergy because when you drink or use a substance, you, your body reacts in a certain way. So like, because when I drink, my body reacts in a way where it's like, I can't have just the one same with like doing drugs for the, if I was the person, I was always just trying to get more, 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 more. Right. And so if I am, I have to regulate the way that my brain handles that now in terms of like, okay, if I want to go eat, like go to McDonald's, it's very easy for me to go and just be like, all right, I'm going to have a fucking McChicken and some, and a quarter pounder. And, oh, maybe let's throw a Big Mac in there too. Why not? <laughs> Why not? It's only $2 like, or whatever. Yeah, but I don't get high off of eating meat, unfortunately. If yeah, I you did, don't get then, fucked up and ruin right. your life, crash your car, I get, I get meat sweats. Sure. And, and yeah, but maybe that's some not, diarrhea. Right. I don't need that in my life either. So it's, no, it's, not it's all same. figuring out like, the different the the ways to handle and mitigate that reward but i do like uh i do like running a lot running is great i try and eat, you know eating this vegetarian stuff more and more often has been feeling really good i've definitely lost some weight since doing quarantine and eating these more vegetarian meals but awesome. i will uh i will postmates myself a good chicken sandwich every once in a while so i still get that lifestyle that's that sounds like it's all working out does your girlfriend make you brush your teeth after you eat meat before you kiss her no Okay, Thank great, God. great. You got a good one. You got a good one. Yeah, she, uh, she's, she, she's down with the little bacon taste if it comes to it. Awesome. Maybe, maybe I should rethink the way I, you know, I always think uh, that vegans hate people or vegetarians hate people that aren't vegan or vegetarian, but it's not. It's like, I'm sure you don't hate people that drink and smoke. Yeah, no, it's just, it's your lifestyle, you know? Mm. I, I don't, I'm, it's just, it's something that doesn't work for me doesn't mean that you're not allowed to uh to enjoy yourself and do that yeah well i think uh you were an inspiration to a lot of people that want to put up the the put up their their what do you call it put their shoes away or whatever when you retire from drinking and alcohol you know i feel like you just have a lot of fun you've done it you've seen it you had your drinks you had your your drugs and then it's kind of like well what am i really gaining from this time after time i think that's a big reason why i got married uh, because I was ready to like not have the same experience over and over and over again. And a big part of being married is I'm home a lot more than I was before. I would be out at comedy shows or open mics or wherever and hanging out, drinking and smoking. So just being married has decreased the amount that I drink and smoke by a yeah. huge, huge percentage. It uh, it, It's one of those things, man, where it's like I'm almost five years sober now. Uh, and I Thank you. And I feel... I, I haven't been so happy to have just like sort of a boring ass normal life for for the most part. Like comedy is a weird thing, you know, going out and doing stuff at comedy clubs and working in this industry is a very weird, surreal thing. And I still feel very grateful that I get to do that. But like the weirdness of comedy enough and going to some after parties every now and again, even sober, like that's enough for me. I don't need to be the person who's like staying out at in, until four in the morning every night like some no of my way. some of my friends it's you know i had fun doing that before i can still swing doing that every yeah. now and again but hey good for you guys have yeah, fun. you did it you did, did it, it. Yeah, I, had no. a good, I, I can i can have a good time and uh and also say oh i need to i need to sleep that's a that's also a good time for me well i appreciate it that's mature i appreciate you being here we're gonna wrap up uh just plug your special one more time and then your social media anywhere we could find you if you got anything yeah. uh, people could see online let so them know. the album's out on uh pandora exclusive and it is available for pre-order it's called good guy with a gun it is i'm it's my favorite thing that i've ever made i'm very happy with it so go check it out you will not regret it and you can find it at my social media at diet j on twitter and instagram uh and i also got a podcast too if you want to check that out and you like talking about movies uh i have this movie podcast where we talk about movies you hate and why you hate them called blockbusting you blockbusting get that where you get podcasts yeah blockbusting good guy with a gun 
Diet J. I will put it all in descri- the description. Thank you guys for listening. Pet Peeves Podcast listeners, you can find us uh, on Instagram at Pet Peeves Podcast, on Twitter at Pet Peeves Pod. You can find me, Albert Escobedo, on Instagram at Albert Escobedo, on Twitter at Albert M. Escobedo. You can find my comedy special free to watch on YouTube. Don't judge me. And that's it. Thank you guys for being here. Jay, thank you again one more time for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Albert. It's fun, man. Yeah, for sure. It was a lot of fun. Tell your cats. I said, what's up? Tell your girlfriend. I said, what's up? You guys have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. All right.